morning, everyone. I am so glad to be with you today. Uh, why don't we just stand, even if you're at home, even this might be a little awkward, that's okay. No one will judge you. And uh, let's just pray, and then we will start with some worship. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come together, not even if it's through a computer screen or through a phone screen. Lord, you're still in our midst. And Lord, we thank you that you're so faithful. Even in these times of uncertainty, we know that you're in control. We know that you're still the same God that we knew before this all happened. And you'll be the same God throughout the throughout the entirety of this thing, Lord. So Holy Spirit, just come. Dwell in our homes, Lord. Let's just let's just worship. Waiting here 
for you with our hands lifted high in praise and it's you we adore singing
help us to remember when we forget. Because we're such a forgetful people. But Lord, we don't want to forget who you are and who you call us to be. stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you song in my soul and I feel it's stubborn in me this I know for sure that your love is like a flood and your mercy never ending I give my song to you there's a song in my soul and a like the morning this I know for sure that your grace is enough and your promise never breaking I give my song to you all of your goodness is like a way There's a hope in my heart, burning bright in the darkness. This I know for sure, that I will look upon your face, forever dwell in your presence, and always I'll sing to you. All of your goodness is like a well. to you 
a symphony singing out holy holy all my days every single breath i breathe singing out holy holy let my life let my life be to you a symphony singing out holy Every single breath I breathe, singing out, Holy God, you are holy. All of your goodness is like a well running over. Oh, my soul, it sings for you. For all of your goodness, I will love you forever. Oh, my soul. So my songs I'll sing for you. Yes, oh my songs I'll sing for you. Amen. So Lord, uh, God, we just ask that that would be true, that we would be, Lord, just focusing on you in our lives. God, that you would be the only only God that we have. Lord, as we dig into your word, we just ask that you would come meet us. Come just do a work. Reveal yourself to us in new ways as we're in this new season. Lord, we just ask that you would, yeah, that you would just do what only you can do. In your name, amen. Hi there, my name is Lisa, and I want to thank you for joining us today for Calvary Southbury's online Sunday experience. You know, we really miss seeing you guys in person, but isn't it so cool that we can share this time together from our homes? It is great to be with you, and we love that you're watching. So can I ask you to text us and let us know you're here? All you have to do is text HERE I AM to 97000. That's H-E-R-E-I-A-M, all one word, to the number 97000. If it's your first time texting, you'll get a message back with a link. Click that link to give us your name and your email so we can keep you up to date on everything that's going on. If it's your first time watching, then texting Here I Am is a great first step to help us get to know you and to care for you better. What I'm really excited to tell you about is an online event that we have coming up on Wednesday, April 29th at 7 p.m. It's called Make the Most of Now, and it's designed to give us practical tools to reach out to others, to love our neighbors, and to share the reason for the hope that we have in Jesus. There's no sign up for this, and everyone is invited. All you need is a computer or a smartphone and the Zoom app. Zoom is what we've been using for our online weekly gatherings like prayer and life groups. So just like those groups, you can find the link to this at our website, calvaryfromhome.com. And if you need help with Zoom, there are tutorials at calvaryfromhome.com. So put this on your calendar, make room in your schedule. You do not want to miss this. I promise it will be worth it. You know, we're living in a really unique time right now. There's no denying that. So let's get real together. Let's get on mission together. Let's put our faith in action. We are in this together. Let's make a difference together and make the most of now. So on Wednesday night, go to calvaryfromhome.com, click on the link to the webinar, and join us. I'll see you on Wednesday. Here's Pastor Trey. Okay, I, I want you just for a second to close your eyes. Seriously, we're going to imagine together. I want you to think about you. You're, you're standing, you're, you're looking out a window, you're inside, and all the lights are on. You're looking outside, and it's actually a very dark night. There's no moon. So what do you see? Well, you see a whole lot of nothing, right? You see nothing outside. You probably just see a big 
black mass because the lights are on inside and, and your uh, eyes are adapted to, to see in the light. So you can't see outside. Actually, probably the only thing you do see in all of that glass is your own reflection, your own reflection. But imagine now what would happen if the lights in your home were suddenly switched off. Suddenly you wouldn't be able to see yourself anymore. And instead, slowly but surely, your eyes would be able to make out what's outside. As your eyes adapt and your pupils dilate, the things that were always there right behind that glass would become clearer. You would actually be able to see them now. I want you to hold that picture in your mind for the next couple minutes as we unpack God's word. I, reason I want to do that is because I think it's really a, a good way to illustrate what I see the Lord doing right now. The lights are off and now we can see clearly what's on the other side. So let's just pray and uh, then we'll open up the word together. So Lord, I thank you. I thank you for every man, woman, child, whoever is on the other side of this screen, Lord, listening to your word. Lord, we need your spirit. We need your instruction. Lord, we need to hear from you and be built up by you. God, it is all that we want. It is all that we need. It's all that we care about, Lord. Teach us to see clearly what you're doing in this time. Speak to us by your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, or, you know, whatever time it is that you're watching this. <sighs> what a crazy time we're living in. What a disruption we are experiencing of our lives, right? What do I mean? What does life look like right now? Uh, we can't go to restaurants. Uh, if we're going to go out, we have to wear masks. Uh, we don't get to go to church, obviously, because you're not at church. You're, you're, uh, you're right here in the screen. Um, we don't get to be with our friends. You don't want to open up your uh, you know, 401k and find out what's going on in the stock market. That's, that's not good. Nobody wants to think about that. So many people are unemployed. So many people are afraid. And so many people are wondering, like they never have before, what is the future going to look like? What does the future look like for me and my family? Today, I want us to turn to, in, in, to God's word and, and open it up. And, and just let's, like, let's just like ask the Lord, hey, Lord, what are you doing how, how can we find comfort here in the midst of this time? We're going to be in 2 Corinthians, if you want to open that up. Chapter 4, verse 6 is where we're going to start. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Go ahead and get that. Um, I've called this message, The Good News About Bad News. The Good News About Bad News. Because truly, I think that this time of pandemic, this time of uncertainty, this time of, for many people, suffering, though... It feels like really bad news. God can use it. He can use this time for good. And not just like for good. God can use bad news to bring about the absolute best results. I believe that God is using this disruption in our lives for good. It's like the lights have gone out in the house that we've been living in. And instead, now we can just see truly for ourselves what's actually going on behind the glass. We can see what's always been there. We can see the Lord's will for us, what he's calling us to more clearly now than we could have otherwise. So there's good news in the midst of all of this bad news. So let's find out what it is. Let's turn to the word, starting in verse six. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. <laughs> awesome. Right here, Paul, the writer of this book, he's making a direct reference to the creation story, Genesis 1-3, where God speaks light into existence. Where there's only darkness, God speaks and suddenly there's light. And, and Paul's drawing a parallel between God's original calling forth of light and what he's done as he sent Jesus Christ into the world. In, in the same way that God said, let there be light in the darkness, Paul is telling us that God has now made light shine into our hearts. And it's by that light in the face of Jesus Christ that we see all the glory of God, all who God is, all of his love, all of his holiness, all of his beauty, all of his grace, it shines in Jesus Christ, God himself taken on flesh. 
See, the good news for us, if we're followers of Jesus, the good news about bad news is that Jesus shines in the darkness. When things are pitch black, when we don't know where to go, what to do, there is comfort in the light of Jesus Christ. Jesus is light. In John 8, 12, Jesus said this, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. See, the good news about bad news is that when the lights go out, when my world falls apart, if I follow Jesus, I have a light that's true, that cannot be extinguished. It leads to life and it keeps me from walking in darkness. See, the power in our homes, the lights in our homes have gone out, but now we can see through glass and we can see all the more clearly that those who are in Jesus have a light in their hearts, that you, if you're a follower of Jesus, have a light in your heart that the world does not know about. See, normally, if you're sitting at home uh, and the power just suddenly goes out, it's the middle of the night, what do you do? Well, you you hope that you have your phone on you and you can turn the flashlight on, right? But if that doesn't work, whew, you got to get up. You got to start finding a wall. Go to probably the place in the basement where you keep the flashlight. When you get there, you're going to find out the flashlight wasn't there because your kids moved it. Then you're going to start yelling at your kids and saying, where's the flashlight? And eventually you're going to light a candle. Maybe I'm just getting a little too personal. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you know, when the lights go out, we want to turn them back on. But can I just say, look, the lights have gone out in our, in our culture, in our society, in, in so many ways. Like there's so much uncertainty. There's darkness all around us. The lights have gone out, but it is okay. You don't need to run around like a chicken with your head cut off, hoping for things to go back to normal. You don't need to put all your hope in that. Instead, you can just look and see what God's showing you. As the lights are off, you can see what's actually there in front of you. And I think that we'll find that we have plenty of light. We have plenty to hope in and that God is showing us something great in this time. If we would be willing to listen, that's the good news about bad news. Let's keep, let's keep going on. Verse 7, now we have this light shining in our hearts but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. It is great news that we have light in Jesus, a light that won't go out. Um, but it's funny because as Paul talks about here, that brilliant, resilient, beautiful light in the face of Jesus is in such dire and direct contrast to our own selves, the keepers of this light, you know, our own hearts, our own bodies. Like compared to the beauty of that light, we're nothing. In fact, Paul compares our bodies to fragile clay jars that contain a great treasure. And he's basically telling the believers and, and us by extension, hey, God has done a great work and you are nothing, and that is awesome. Well, and how countercultural is that? I mean, it was countercultural in Paul's day, but it's certainly countercultural in ours. See, in our world, we think that being the best, the smartest, the coolest, the richest, the most powerful man, those are the things we aspire to. We believe in the potential of human achievement. That's the gospel of secular culture, the good news of secular culture, which actually isn't very good at all. It's that you can have it all, you can be your best self, you can be the master of your own destiny. But what Paul says about us here is so important for us to lay hold of. He says that we're just like dried mud. We crack, we're fragile. We might have convinced ourselves that we're something great, but actually, uh, we're just fragile clay pots, fragile jars. It's easy to think otherwise, though, right? 
I mean, I know my own heart. I'm confessing this to you. It is easy for me to think otherwise. I've definitely seen how easy it is for me to think that I am something that I'm not, to think that I am something worthy and awesome and powerful. See, uh, so many of us who want to be followers of Jesus, to just seek him above all, we get distracted. Because as we are looking out the mirror, we're trying to seek the Lord, to find him, to to behold him. We start to see something else in that glass. We start to see our own reflection. We start to get our eyes upon our own selves. We start to uh, let the light of our culture that values individualism and, and, and uh, it values self. And we let that obscure us, obscure the truth from us. We can't see what's actually true. And because we're sinners, we begin to get more interested in our own selves and in our own betterment and in pursuing our own happiness for its own sake than in seeking to follow Jesus. We begin to find our identity not in Jesus, not in our identity as disciples, as followers of him, but in other things. We get our our comfort and our peace from things like our jobs, from things like our social lives, things like our bank accounts and what other people think about us, the power that we feel that we have. We put, put, our, put our hope in any number of things. That's just what the human heart does. The human heart is an idol factory. We create idols. We give value to things that should not be valued, and we worship things that should not be worshipped, and we can worship ourselves so easily. That's what our culture does, and we can do the same thing. Um, we can even do that with our religious, even, even, even with our pursuit of God, with our religion. Um, We can think of ourselves as being the best, most obedient followers of Jesus, right? And we can look down upon others. We can take comfort in all the scripture knowledge we have. Never mind we're not uh, obeying the Lord in lots of things, but we know lots of things about scripture. We can take comfort in in our spiritual feelings that we have and neglect the, own pra- the, the practice of love for one another. We can take comfort in our sense of superiority over the culture that we see around us and forget that we're called to serve selflessly and to be ambassadors for the kingdom of God in the midst of this generation. In Romans uh, 12, 3, Paul says, be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Look, the good news about bad news <clears throat> is that right now, the lights have gone out. That's good news. All the things that we tend to get obsessed with, our own self we see reflected in the mirror, we, we think of about our own status and our jobs and the, and the way other people perceive us and our, and our wealth, all those things are disrupted. The lights are off. You can't care about those things right now because, because there's, no, there's no way to do it. Um, and now, with all those distractions taking away, we can see rightly We can see how flimsy our obsession with our own selves is and how fragile we really are. And I got to tell you, that's great news. It's great. It's great to start to be honest with ourselves, to be honest with God about who we are, the fact that we're just weak and we're dependent upon God, and that he's strong, and it's his power and strength that sustains us. See, that is such good news, because when we understand that, we can actually start to walk in a new way. Paul says in verse 7, having a solid understanding of our weakness and God's presence and strength in our life, It, and I quote, makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. When we understand our weakness and understand God's strength, we make it clear through experience that it's God's great power and not ourselves that's sustaining us. It's great news to be weak. 
It's great news to know that our security is not sustained or secured by our own efforts, by our own skills, by our intelligence, or by our power, but it's God's power alone. It's God who sustains us. It's him who does it. That is great news. So I just wanted to check in with you. How you doing? How's your quarantine going? And here's a good question. Something I think that will help us to evaluate like where our heart is. What are you anxious for? What are you anxious for in this time? Steve Cuss, his name is a pastor uh, in, in Colorado. He says, anxiety is caused when we believe that we need something that we do not actually need. So what are you anxious for? What are you feeling that you need that you don't actually need? Because the lights have been turned off, right? All the normal things in life have just kind of been put on hold. All the stuff that we valued, all the stuff that we made the basis of our identity, it's gone or it's threatened. Does that make you anxious? I mean, really, does it? And I tell you, that's great news. It's great news if you feel anxious because for a long time, you and me, we have felt that we've needed things that we don't need. And now we're left only with God, only with his great power. So we can stop when we feel anxious and we can just say, Lord, like clearly something's off. Clearly, I have trusted in something that I need to provide, and I'm not trusting in you to provide what I need. So if you're anxious, would you just go to the Lord with that. Just go to the Lord with that. I know I'm going to do that as well. So we're left with an opportunity here at this time to trust him and to live as if it's actually true that he is the only sure basis for our security. That is good news in the midst of bad news. That is an opportunity to grow in our faith, one that we desperately need. Hey, let's keep going on in verse 8. Here's what Paul says. We're pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed through suffering. Our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. <laughs> now, look, I know that what Paul is describing there doesn't sound super appealing, right? I, I think a lot of that has to do with the way we normally think about challenges, about suffering, about difficulty. Um, there's a writer and a professor named Kate, I think it's Bowler. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, she has an autobiography about her diagnosis with cancer and how it really just disrupted her life and made her think differently about the way that the Lord works. Um, she talks about the way she used to see pain and difficulty this way. I'm going to read you a quote here. She says, she used to believe that God had a worthy plan for my life where every setback would also be a step forward. I wanted God to make me good and to make me faithful with just a few accolades along the way, anything would do if hardship was only a detour on my life's long journey. I'm going to read that last line again. Anything would do if hardships were only a detour on my life's long journey. Look, nobody, nobody really believes um, that we're never going to suffer. We're never going to have difficulty in life. You don't believe that. I don't believe that. Uh, yeah, we don't believe that. You're going to. But I think that most of us do think about hardships this way. We think that hardship should just be a detour on life's journey. Like we just go around it, we get over it. We think the difficulty would be, should be something that we just get through so we can actually get on with the good stuff, with the real stuff, with the stuff where the hardship isn't a factor anymore. But here's the, the really strange, really, reality that, that, that we're revealed here. There's good news about bad news in this. Suffering and difficulty is not just a detour. It's not something for the believer that we just need to get through. Let's read again what Paul says in verse 10. It says this, through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. 
In another translation, it's this way. He says this, we are always carrying around in the, in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our bodies. What Paul is saying is that suffering and difficulty, it's not just getting in the way. It's not just keeping you from something better. It's not just something that you need to get through. In fact, the suffering and the pain in life, what Paul says he's always carrying around with him, it's through that very pain and suffering that the power of Jesus to bring life is most manifest in us. If it weren't for the suffering, the power of God would not be known for what it is. Can you think about that for a second? Suffering is not a detour. It's not the destination either, but it is a part of the plan. God can use it to manifest his life within us so effectively. There's no mistake in it. God can meet us there. Look, look at Colossians 1.11 for a second. It says this. Paul's praying for the church in this introductory, introduction to Colossians. He says, May you be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. We like that part. May you be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. I would think that if I'm being strengthened with all might according to God's power, that that would be for getting over my problem. But what Paul says, you need to be strengthened with God's might and power so that you can have patience and joy. That's not about getting over it, getting past it. That's about walking with the Lord in the midst of suffering. God's power is a manifest in pain and suffering, not to get us away from pain and away from suffering, but to give us endurance, to teach us patience, and to give us joy in the midst of trial. The good news about bad news is that the gospel is for people who suffer. The gospel is this great news that we have a king who is overcoming the world and he's not just a God who gives life, but he is a God who has tasted suffering and death. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. That's how the Bible describes Jesus. But one who, despite the suffering and despite the pain inflicted upon him, he was sustained by the power of God. He knew joy in the middle of that pain doesn't take away from the suffering, but it gives great comfort in the midst of it. The good news about bad news is that God's power is manifest when there's bad news in the world. When the light goes out, when our world feels disrupted, when it feels like the wheels are coming off and you feel the pain of uncertainty, God's power is all the more acute right then in that moment because you are called to and equipped to and enabled to trust him in that pain. And when we do, when we trust him through the pain, we know and experience his power. When we accept our weakness and rely and depend upon him, then he pours out his grace upon us. We experience his power in patience, in joy, in assurance, in endurance. And it's so unlike any experience of suffering we've ever had. That is good news. It's going on in verse 11. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. There's one last great piece of good news, great news in the midst of bad news, and that's this, that God uses your witness. He can use your witness as you go through suffering with faith and hope to point people to his saving power. As you navigate pain and suffering and uncertainty that perplexes the world, if you, as you do that with joy and hope and peace, people take notice. 
I was listening to um, a pastor named Terry Walling. He was talking about the times that we're living in, and his message was really, was really to pastors and leaders of churches, but I think it's just so applicable to anyone who's a follower of Jesus. Uh, he's talking about how we can navigate these kind of uncertain times as people who want to, to, to continue to do ministry, to continue to see the kingdom built. He says this, in the days ahead, the people that can be a part of something that truly builds and extends the kingdom will not work out of their great abilities to wow a crowd, to speak, or all of those things that we put our confidence in. The things that people will follow now is the presence of Jesus on your life. Spiritual authority is the fragrance of Jesus placed on our life because we've chosen to follow Jesus and put our confidence in his deeper work in us. All the other sources of authority, all the other sources of identity and comfort that we normally put our trust in, they're slipping away. It doesn't matter what your job title is now. All right, everybody's just a guy on a Zoom call. Um, it doesn't matter how other people think of you. It doesn't matter how charismatic or smart you are. What matters now more than ever is simply spiritual authority. That's what people are looking for. You don't have spiritual authority because you think of yourself so highly. You think you're, you're the boss, right? You have spiritual authority because you've humbled yourself at the feet of Jesus. You've taken the place that you've been given in all of your weakness, in all of your failings, as a disciple of Jesus Christ. You've taken that simple place as a follower, as a learner, as someone who seeks him out, who looks for him above everything else, who seeks to obey him with your whole heart, who does what he says, who takes on his character, who lets the Lord do that sanctifying work in, in, in the heart, teaching us obedience. That's what spiritual authority is. You can't fake it. Right now, people are looking for the real thing. And if you want to have the spiritual authority, if you want to be the real thing, then you just come and you humble yourself at Jesus' feet. You just come in all of your weakness so that he will fill you with all the power of God. Guys, the lights are off. Your own reflection is gone. How you think of yourself, it doesn't matter anymore. What matters is how you are, and that's a freeing place to be. There's no more posturing. There's no more acting like you. You have your life together. No one has their life together right now. All we have right now is do we follow Jesus? Do we spend time in his presence? Are we being filled with his power as we are emptying ourselves of ourself? Now what matters, all that matters is that you seek Jesus, that you trust in him. And when you do that, people are going to see. They're going to notice. And you are going to be able to lead them right into the, the place where Jesus is. You're going to be able to minister that grace to them. So just to wrap up, guys, the lights have been turned off. Don't try to turn them back on. It's awesome. It's awesome. The light of culture, the light of busyness, the light that just lights up our own obsession with ourselves. It was getting in the way of us seeing Jesus. That's just part of who we are. We're just, we're just weak like that. We don't know how to navigate these things. This time when the world is kind of on pause, this is a, it's a time of grace. It's a time that Jesus is going to do amazing things if we would be willing to get our eyes upon him. So just to wrap up here, um, I really just want to reinforce this, this image that we've been, we've been uh, doing right now. See, God has turned off the lights, right? And where we were before unable to see what he was doing, now we can see more clearly what's going on. And I hope that you take this time and that you learn to follow the Lord in the midst of this. 
I want you to actually think about your mindset right now. Think about your mindset because I think that matters so much for, for how we go about thinking about problems. What's, what's going on is the Lord is, the, the lights have just been turned off. Uh, kind of the, the wheel of culture and busyness has stopped for a time. But one of these days, the lights are going to come back on and the busyness is going to continue. But I want you to think about what's going on in your life right now so that when the, when the lights go back on and the world goes back to the way it was, that you are not the same person that you were when the lights were turned off. Because this is a time of transition. This is a time of growth. Guys, make the most of this opportunity that you have in front of you. You don't, the things that you struggled with before, apathy, doubt, cynicism, sin, you can be free of those as you press into Jesus now. And as he pours out his grace on you, you can be a different person. You can take this time where you might have extra time and where God, I think, is really calling us to move forward and you can make the most of it. You can do all the things that we've been talking about. You can, you can walk in weakness. You can embrace it. You can, you can seek his patience and his grace in the midst of suffering, right? You can do those things. But also, I think you can do some practical things in order to sustain the advances that I think you're going to be making as you seek the Lord. You can start to... As you're going through this time of transition, build into your life new habits and and things that are going to sustain this transformation, this transition that you're going to be having, okay? So two things I want to suggest to you. Number one, I want you to absolutely in this time spend daily time with the Lord. It could be in the morning if that works for you, but here's a thought. Like, you know, the morning seems to work because it's before all the busyness uh, starts. Hey, man, what if you just do it right in the heart of your day, if that works for you? And, but then when you go to this new life, continue to do it. Take your lunch time. Take, take time, time that you can find. Carve it out and say, Lord, this is going to be your time from now on when the busyness starts again, when life gets crazy again. This is going to be yours. This is going to be yours. Start to build your life around him, around spending time with him. So that's one thing. Build in some time with the Lord every day. And number two, I want to challenge you to at least once a day, spontaneously spend time with the Lord. Just pray. Just worship. Just talk to God about how awesome he is and all the things that you're seeing him do. Maybe you've never done that before. Maybe that sounds weird. Hey, just try it. And then as you're going out and as things get back to normal, continue to do it. You need to be a person who continues to trust in the Lord after this. You need to build in your life habits of trust, habits that build and sustain trust and relationship with Jesus. So those are the two challenges. And then one last one. I want you to do this. I want you to start talking with your family and with your friends about Jesus. I want you to talk about what you see God doing. I want you to think about it and really start some conversations. Because you know what? I just really think most of us in our, in our family lives, like we don't talk about the Lord because we never have. We don't know how to start that habit. With our friends, we don't know how to start the habit of having honest discussions. Now is a time, you know, where people have time and where you, I think, can be uniquely willing to learn this new habit. Like as you do that, God is going to use that. He's going to use that not only to grow you in your faith right now, but as you get out and we get back to normal, he's going to continue to use you as a person who stands out and is a light in this world. It's going to be awesome, guys. And then one final thing I want you to put on your calendar. Um, This Wednesday, April 29th at 7 p.m., we're hosting a webinar on Zoom. So it's not like a Zoom where everybody talks. It's actually a Zoom where just a few people talk, right? Um, So Pastor John, myself, and and some few other guests are going to just be talking through really 
how do we, the, the question is, how do we make the most of now? How do we make the most of this moment? And really the focus is on how do we make the most of this moment and how do we share Jesus with those who are seeking Jesus right now? Because a lot of people are spiritually open. A lot of people are curious. So it's really like an evangelism training. And it's also just talking about, um, you know, the why of why we would share and how we could share and giving you some specific ideas of ways that all of us can come together and minister and reach out in this time. So please come to that. Um, Awesome. Guys, let's pray. And then I hope you have a great Sunday. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that we can have, we can relish this good news in the midst of bad news. Lord, I thank you that we can trust you and seek you and worship you always, Lord, that you're always worthy even when things are hard. God, especially when things are hard, you pour out grace to meet us in the moment, Lord. Lord, we are not afraid of where you're bringing us. Lord, we want to be coming out on the other side of this more faithful, filled with your spirit. Lord, build us up, Lord. Give us the spiritual authority, the spiritual authority that comes as people who just humble ourselves before you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Bye-bye. Hello, Calvary family. Hey, great to be with you all. I am actually at the church property today. As you can see in the background, you'll see some other clips of it throughout this video. Hey, I just wanted to give you a quick rundown as to where we are in this whole process of building. So this video is going to be an update of where we are physically with this building and when it's going to be done, as well as where we are financially as well. So, So both those things, physically and financially. Well, first off, you know, the only reason why this has happened and where we are, where we are today is because of you guys. I mean, that's why it is where it is. I mean, you guys were the one who saw God's vision for the church and you got behind it. You know, you guys are the reason why, you know, we prayed about this. We fasted. We invested to see God's kingdom advance in our land. And and look and look what he's done. I mean, it's it's absolutely amazing. Look, we recognize, you know, we recognize the sovereignty and all powerfulness of God. We we get that. We got that. But you know what? We also recognize God's calling for us to engage in his kingdom. We know that as well. And so like we can engage in his kingdom either passively or actively. You know, passively is like one of those things where we go, well, you know, basically kick back and go, God's going to do what God's going to do. Right now, I don't know, maybe that's not quite passive, but may call it something else. But anyway, where God doesn't need my help to do anything, right? Active, on the other hand, is we know God's kingdom, God's desire is to see his kingdom advance in our generation. And God has put us in this generation to reach this generation. And we choose to be part of that and to see God's mission done on earth like he commissioned us to do. And so, you know, I'm going to invest in that with my time, with my prayer, with my finances. And in fact, even to the point of making sacrifices. And, you know, I know a lot of you guys, that's exactly what you did. Like you, you sacrifice to see this happen right here today, right? You, a sacrifice is something where I dedicate, I dedicate something to God where I actually feel it, where it costs me right? That's what a sacrifice is. It's like if I kept it, if I kept it for myself, I could go and do something else, but I'm choosing to not do something else in order to dedicate it into God's kingdom. And you know what? Many of you chose to do that. And so with the giving and with the sacrifices, we're in this place here today. You know, the building has been continuing to go on straight through the COVID-19, you know, crisis. We're still scheduled to oh, to be in at the end of May, beginning of June. So we're still right on schedule. Some of the materials have been hung up in, you know, in Massachusetts and so forth. There's a little bit of shipping problems with some of it, but there's other work that's being done. And so we seem, still seem to be right on schedule. Um, as you can see, like some of the exteriors already been done. You know, um, there's sidings going on. Their windows are in, in the coffee area here. Windows are going in in other areas, even as we speak. Um, inside, floors are being polished. Inside, the rough 
plumbing, the electrical, the installation is, is all being done. Well, I think actually all of that stuff is done. Um, and look, we are, we're in a place where things are going to rapidly move forward quickly. And it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. I encourage you guys, come by here, stop by, come into the parking lot, don't go into the building, come into the parking lot and, and, and pray, give thanks to God while, while you're here. And you know what, I, I reason one of the reasons why I want you to come by is because when you enter into this place, you can sense God's pleasure upon it. I mean, you just, you just full out can. You, when you come here, I guarantee you, you're going to feel like, oh yes, God is using this and is going to use this as a tool to impact this region. And he is. Now, let me say this also about the the building and where we are right now. Um, These months leading up to the opening of the building, I I thought we'd be in a totally different place, right? Well, I mean, none of us saw us sitting home, uh, you know, uh, especially on Sundays. But, you know, we thought we would be in a place where we'd be in the synagogue and we'd be having regular meetings and groups of people coming out to the property and praying, giving regular updates, you know, in church on like where we are and, you know, kind of like going blow by blow kind of things on what God is doing and all. But you know what? God knew that COVID-19 was coming. He knew. I mean, he didn't tell he didn't tell me or you, but he knew. Right. And we knew, though, heading into this, the whole building project, that the last three months were going to be like the hairiest parts for the church. I mean, seriously, right? Because it would be the last three months when our mortgage would be fully realized. We would be paying full on, on the building here, the mortgage. And then we would also be paying full rentals on the Jewish center as well as our church offices. And, and again, so we thought, hey, well, we're just going to let the body know during that time at church, and we're just going to kind of move to it, through it together. And then COVID-19 came, um, and we can't meet together. And so with that, Trey's going to give you an update on where we're at um, um, in the whole process of things financially. Check this out, and then I'll meet with, up with you in a few minutes. Hey, everybody. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm so excited about where we're at in this project. And you could see, um, just looking at uh, what John has, and if maybe you've driven by, you see that we are so close. Um, We've been working for this for really over three years in in the whole process in terms of design and finance and then the actual build. Um, Where we're at right now is just these final two months or so. You know, here at the end of May, we expect to be opening this building. And that is so awesome. It's so awesome for for so many reasons. Um, First is just the timing. You know, when I first, when all this started to happen with with the COVID-19, my initial reaction was like worry, you know, because because what is this going to do to our finances? And what is this going to do to our church? How do we go online? Um, But now I really see something that I think is worth noting. We are going to be opening this building probably right around the same time that the economy is going to be opening up again, that people are going to be able to come out of their homes again. And the world that we live in live in right now is not the same as it was two months ago. People are wondering. They're shaken. They're maybe a little bit worried. They're, they're asking questions they weren't asking before. And isn't it amazing that right on that time when we get to come back out, our church is going to be ready, up and running, and able to invite those people in there's people who are wondering, what is, what, what's, what's going on in the world? Like, like how do I keep going in, in the midst of all this? I think it's so exciting, and I think God's timing is just all over it. Um, so here we are, we're right at the end. Um, and, you know, one thing that we have to really acknowledge is that this has been a big investment. We s- talked about initially our budget was going to be around $5 million, and that's where we're at, you know. We're at the point where we can really count up really the cost very accurately, and we're right o- just slightly over $5 million. We're going to be probably ending at $5 million and $20,000, so $20,000 over our target of $5 million. I think that's pretty awesome. Um, now, you might say, hey, $5 million is a lot of money, <laughs> and you're right. It is a lot of money, um, but... That's where we, what, what it costs to build a building in our town in particular, where there's no sewer and there's no uh, water or natural gas or other utilities, right? The cost of building, uh, where we're at, it, it's expensive. Um, but we, and we built something that we think is going to be able to accommodate the growth that we're expecting, right? And I just pray and I hope that we were just totally wrong, that we have so many people filling up the building, we have to build even more, right? But isn't that worth it? 
Isn't it worth whatever it costs in order to see people coming to the Lord and walking with them? Isn't it worth whatever it takes to, to see New England totally transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ? I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it. <laughs> um, and you know what? I know a lot of you have thought it was worth it because this whole building wouldn't be possible except for the generosity of people just like you, people who have been given throughout this three-year building campaign. We're about two and a half years through the three-year campaign, and up to this point, people just like you have given $1.2 million, actually more than $1.2 million to this project. That is amazing generosity for a church our size. I know that because I talk to other pastors, right? And, and I've done a lot of research on, on what to expect. And we are just blowing expectations out of the water with the amount of giving. So praise God for that. Praise God that he's using people just like you and he's using this church to do something big here in New England. I think we're going to see him do even greater things, right? So, I mean, just talking about where we're at, again, we're in the last two months. We got a $5 million project. We borrowed some money. We've had over $1.2 million come in. We really expect over the next, uh, you know, between now and a little while after the building opens, about $300,000 more dollars just based off of the trajectory where we've been. We expect to take in about $300 more thousand dollars, um, which, is, which is great. Um, but it's just a little bit shy of where we need to be. Um, really, the remaining cost to get us into the building to the point where it's like a, a useful and livable space is about $400,000, which leaves, you know, just a little gap between money you expect to come in and, and where the budget is ultimately going to be. And John's going to tell you a little bit more about that right now. Hey guys, so you see where we are, right? Um, we have 300,000 um, pledge that's gonna be coming in by November. And some people are, are trying to get their pledges in ahead of time so that some of the things can be done in the church, um, again, ahead of time. Um, but we, are, we do have 100,000 on a shortfall. And really, I mean, this is, this is what I'm asking you to do. I mean, if it's possible with you, give towards the building of this, um, especially during this month right now. You know, um, when it comes down to it, you know, to get into this building, that 300,000 is gonna cover us getting into the building, okay? And that's coming in by November. But the $100,000 is going to make this space more of an effective tool for reaching out to other people. Okay, and it's, and it's also gonna enhance the space greatly. You know, the whole design of this building has been um, built around the idea of removing obstacles that keep people from church. So that's, that's why it was designed the way that it was. And also, it was also designed around the fact that the church can be the church in here. And so there's a lot of common spaces for community going on in here. And so that $100,000 um, is, well, it's for areas like, like things like, um, like the sound and lighting in the worship center. Now, that actually has been gutted dramatically and we actually need this. This is $30,000 that we need for that. Okay, that's that really we just need. Um, but also for um, carpeting in the children's area and office areas, we want to upgrade that, and that's like twenty thousand um, dollars. Outdoor patio furniture is like five thousand dollars. Cafe um, tables and chairs, you know, right right here in the coffee house, um, five thousand um, dollars. Commercial grade lounge furniture, which is going to be all throughout the building, uh, that's that's like ten thousand uh, dollars. Espresso coffee equipment, which I think is kind of necessary. Um, that's that's around you know all the equipment that goes with that is around ten thousand as well and then the parking lot which it looks beautiful right now um, but it doesn't have the second layer on it which is actually um, really necessary and that's twenty five thousand dollars and so I know that that parking lot is sort of a little boring but twenty five thousand um, dollars is important for that so you know maybe you're in a spot where you've never really given to support the building or, or maybe not even given to support the church. Um, I encourage you, like, like this is a great time to jump in. If this church is your home, you're part of Calvary, um, look, jump in and, and help support financially as well. You know, together we can reach this goal of 100,000, I think without a big problem. Um, and you know, maybe you've been faithfully giving through, through these three years, especially of the building project and you're making sacrifice, you know, awesome, awesome. You have been, a very big part of making this happen. You know, again, if you can give more in these last couple of months to reach this $100,000 goal, that would be awesome. 
look, we know that now more than ever, you know, the work of the church is vital. Look, I don't think it's a coincidence, Trey mentioned this as well, I don't think it's a coincidence that, that we're going to be opening these doors right around the same time that social distancing and all the restrictions of that should be coming close to an end. We have an opportunity now that, that God is, is going to use this building for, and actually he's already using this building for, to reach out to this region. And it's going to be an effective tool. Look, we have an opportunity to invest in something that's going to make an eternal difference. Like, we, we can use our money for a lot of other things. I mean, look, we all know that, right? I mean, we can, we can build up our retirement. You, you know what I mean? We can, we can um, go, go traveling. We, could, we can buy stuff to put in our garage or put in our, on our storage units and fill these things up, you know, completely. You, you know what? None of that stuff's going to matter in a short time. I mean, none of it is. The kingdom is going to remain forever, and people entering the kingdom are going to remain forever. So I just encourage you, like, invest accordingly. Hey, it has been awesome serving with all you guys. Um, God bless you guys, you know, and just increase, increase. May he increase your capacity to just enjoy his kingdom. God bless you all.